Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Grunfeld, Chairman of the Speakers Program. Um, what we've done here is we've taken all the candidates' names who have appeared on our campus so far under the auspice of the Speakers Program. We took their names, put them into a hat, drew them out at random in front of two other witnesses, and they will be speaking in the order that they came out of the hat. Each will speak for five minutes. Afterwards, there'll be questions and answers from the audience, and there'll be two standing mics right here in, the, in either aisle, and you'll just step up to the mic and ask wh whichever candidate you, you um, want to. First speaking will be uh, Mr. Joel Wax. If you'd like, you can speak to the table. Can I speak to you now? Okay. Thank you very much. I, I'm appreciative of the opportunity of being here. And I'm more appreciative of you having the interest to hear the candidates for the highest office in the city. Because quite frankly, not that many people in this city really do care. It's not that they don't care, it's that they don't hold their politicians in very high regard. Most people believe that unless you can somehow give $5,000 to a campaign or deliver a big block of votes from a political machine, you're pretty well forgotten the day the election is over. Fortune magazine recently took a survey and politicians came below used car salesmen in the eyes of the public. And while that may be humorous, it's pretty sad a situation where the same public officials, us included, are making the very basic decisions that affect our everyday way of life. And yet, in my experience as a councilman, I've seen a lot of things that give people good reason to feel the way they do. City Hall really is dominated by the people who finance campaigns. It's dominated by people who do business with the city and try to use it for their own gain, and by an incredibly insensitive, entrenched bureaucracy which wastes millions of dollars on boondoggle projects perpetuating its own power. Nobody wants to talk about it. But you know, when the people of the Pacific Palisade saw their government go against the overwhelming majority of the people in favor of one oil company, it was more than just an issue of drilling on the beaches, although that should have been an issue in itself. But you had government taking expert testimony from people as prominent as Professor Paul Witherspoon at Berkeley and others, testifying that the drilling might imperil the lives and property of an area because of the history of geological instability and slides in the known fall. And here is a government weighing the probability of risk in deciding in favor of one oil company as opposed to the people. You know, what if we're wrong? If we're wrong, the houses go down the cliff. If we're wrong the other way, it's a little more expensive for Occidental to drill for the oil. But when you consider the fact that they're drilling on a piece of property which they bought from the government, public land, which the state got $34,000 for when it's known to be worth millions. And you ask why you can't have some money for better transportation or a little neighborhood park to make the community a better place to live, and they tell you there's no money. Well, if there's no money, how can you sell a piece of property at that kind of price when you know what it's worth? And it's not just Occidental. It goes on every day in this city. Property being sold at less than it should be, contracts being let out at higher than they should be, taxi cab monopolies in a city where there's no justification for it being, where the service is already abysmally poor, zoning favors given to land developers every single day, which destroy not only the residential communities quite often in which they're going, but tacky projects like Mulholland and Beverly Glen, which begin to destroy one of the most priceless natural resources we have in this city, a 225,000 square mile mountain chain square acre mountain chain, which should be preserved not only for its source of watershed and fresh air, but is potentially an urban national park in which people of both sides of the mountain could use it and not have to go away for two days and three days each weekend. But sooner or later, everybody in this city gets touched by an incident like that, and they begin to lose the faith in their public officials. And the shame of it is, is that it needn't be that way. It needn't be that way within the system itself. We don't need a revolution. We simply need people in positions of power who exercise that power, remembering who the people they were when they asked them to vote for them in the first place. 
It's never going to change with the Jess Unruhs and Sam Yordies of this world who make their whole reputation on political wheeling and dealing and can only be relied upon to do more of the same. Every issue in this city that I've seen that is solvable, the solutions don't come either in terms of progressive legislation or in terms of adequate enforcement of the laws because that legislation or that enforcement would step on the toes of the people who tend to keep you in office in perpetuating your power in office. Every zone favor, zoning change I've seen has come because somebody had enough money to buy enough tables and enough political dinners to ultimately get their way. And even people who are honest men, who don't have the courage to stand up and fight when an issue first comes and just wait till election time, they don't really help the cause either. I can't help but think, Tom, when I read your paper saying how you led the battle against Occidental Petroleum, to look back into the files to see how you first voted for the Occidental land swap in the beginning. And I think that you should answer that here today. What I'm telling you is that basically it is time to elect a person who has the courage and the commitment and the boldness to do what he thinks is right, even if it means just one term of an office if need be, rather than sit back and never make any waves and step on the toes of the people who can keep on affecting your election. And unless you get someone in office like that, the names are going to change and the faces are going to change and the rhetoric is going to clean up, but business is going to go on as usual. And it's because I've been that kind of councilman in my term that I feel very justified now in going to all of the people in this city and asking their support. It has nothing to do with experience. Nobody has more experience than Sam Yorty. It's the people with the most experience who have often perpetuated this very system. I promise to be different. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wax. Next speaking will be Mr. Tom Redden. There's several uh, empty seats here on stage. Uh, Sam Yorty isn't here. Matter of fact, I'm not even sure that he's there. <laughs> Jesse Unruh isn't here. You know where he is? He's planting a tree at USC. in honor of Arbor Day, following which he's going to rap with the students in front of Tommy Trojan, and he's going to walk around the campus uh, shaking hands. It more and more appears that the group that does appear in response to the invitations are those that are represented here on the stage today. We've gotten to know each other so well and our comments so well that if one of them didn't show, I could give their comments for them. <laughs> and sometimes, uh, after three or four of these in a day, I'm not sure that I'm not giving their comments. Interesting thing happened last night. I talked behind uh, Tom Bradley and uh, Jesse Unruh, and by the time the two of them got through, they'd used up everything that I was going to say. The big thing in the campaign is that when you get down to it, the candidates do all end up talking about relatively the same thing. Uh, some things, are, however, are different. I offer myself as a candidate with a little different approach to things governmental. Uh, I don't offer myself as a politician because I am not one. In the pure sense, I may be since I'm running for political office, but. Uh, Historically, I have not been a politician. I offer myself as an administrator, as an executive, as one who has run a major organization and who has the ability to bring together a massive, gigantic organization with all of its various responsibilities into a group that works for the benefit of all the people that that organization is designed to serve. I'm the only among the challengers for the job that does have that experience. Uh, Yordi says he has that experience. Uh, he has been mayor for 12 years, and it's kind of hard to, to
to fault that statement. He has been mayor for 12 years. And I think a great number of us feel that uh, 12 years is certainly enough and that it certainly is time for a change at City Hall. I believe that I could bring into government a managerial ability that could make our system work better. I believe I'd bring the ability to spot such things as waste and inefficiency, to root out uh, duplication and eliminate it, the ability to reorganize so that we could in the process make city government work better, more efficiently and more economically. And I believe that I could do it for the benefit of everybody in this city, uh, regardless of their place in the political spectrum or regardless of their place in the economic ladder. I have uh, talked a lot during the campaign about the fact that I am non-political, despite the fact that there are those who try to categorize me at uh, some specific place on the uh, philosophical spectrum. I am uh, non-political. Uh, as such, I have no political hang-ups that would get in the way of my being a representative for the city uh, with the city council, uh, with the board of supervisors in Sacramento and in Washington, D.C. I can go to those places. I have gone to those places on behalf of the city, and I've been accepted as an individual that is known without any regard to political coloration at all. I think that's to the advantage of our city. When I think in terms of the the other things that have become paramount issues in the campaign, I think the problem of, not the problem, the statement of the mayor that he has no power is one that does require examination because the mayor in this city has tremendous power. And uh, the disclaimer that Yorty has issued to saying, I have no power, it's a lousy charter, it's a bad city council, uh, how do you expect me to do anything? has been really marvelously successful because a lot of people really don't expect him to do anything. I, the mayor has the power to appoint commissioners in this city. And uh, he also has the power to appoint approximately one half of all the general managers of the departments in this city. Now, depending upon how you count, there's something between 29 and 33 different commissions, all of whom the mayor appoints, five members each. And there's somewhere between the 29 and 33 departments, depending on how you count, where about half of them, the mayor does appoint the general manager. Additionally, he has great power over the budget. He has power over the budget that the governor does not have over the state budget, that the president does not have over the national budget. and. Uh, you all know that the one who pulls the purse strings does wield tremendous power. In my house, I know who controls the purse strings, and she has uh, tremendous power. I have been told that our time has, uh, uh, has elapsed. Thank you for your friendly reception. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Redden. Next speaking will be Mr. Tom Bradley. Thank you, Jeff. Some of you may have observed a few weeks ago that there was a lawsuit filed because Tom Redden had listed his, his occupation as former chief of police. And the judge said, well, you haven't worked at that job for a long time. You can't list that on your ballot. Tom, I think you ought to protest, because I don't know how Sam Yorty gets away with his. <laughs> you know, it's true that if you are unlucky enough to draw number three or four or five in that list, uh, just about everything that you would have said has been said by the prior speakers. And uh, I'm not going to take a great deal of time going over some of those matters that you've already heard. We pretty well spelled out uh, those comments about the mayor. We have, I think, pretty well indicated uh, 
what we think the powers are. I think it's a question of how you're going to use those powers. To say that the mayor of this city has no authority, no power, is absolute nonsense, because if he used the authority that he has, power granted under the law, that would be an enormous amount of ability and power at his command. But I think the even more important power is the responsibility, the obligation, the opportunity to serve as a spokesman for all other people, to go to those places where you can be the advocate for the city. I just returned from Washington, D.C., the White House, and uh, the meeting of the National uh, League of Cities and the Association of Mayors. I was there to speak on behalf of this city. And I asked you, where was Sam Yorty? Home counting his blue chip stamps. <laughs> you know, if, if the mayor wanted to visit one of the sister cities, whether Bombay or Bordeaux, you can be sure that he would be the one who'd go in person. But if it's a matter of going to Washington for the purpose of serving as the advocate, the spokesman for this city, he sends a second and third team. He doesn't even deign to go. And that's been a part of the problem in the city for a long time. The mayor simply has had no concern for the problems, the real problems of this city. And he's left that responsibility to others. He has backed away from what I think are his obligations. I think that the mayor ought to get involved in those matters of transportation, those matters of what happens in our schools, what happens when the president's budget proposes to cut back on child care centers, when the president's budget will cut out the heart of many of the programs that deal with the social issues of our city, when there is a failure to develop a kind of rational growth policy for this city, we hear nothing from the mayor. These are areas in which the influence of that office, properly used, appearing before the public every day, using the television and radio and other communications media for the purpose of really delivering an important substantive message, he could accomplish much. He could be the catalyst. He could be the inspirational force in this city. And that's the way I propose to use that job. And don't let anybody tell you that you can achieve things in Washington only if you have no prior political hang-ups, if you have no kind of identification with a political party. You know, I'm very well identified. The president knows where I stand, and he knew where I stood last November, and he knows I voted against him. But that didn't... That didn't prevent me from getting into the White House to talk about the important problems of this city. Any administration, and I don't care what the political party may be, is willing to talk to and to listen to the leaders of the great cities of this country. If you've got a problem to present, if you've got some ideas that you want to discuss, they're anxious to listen. They were li willing to listen, for example, when I proposed last year a revitalization program for the whole of Southern California based primarily upon this city. And I think that's the way in which you achieve things in Washington, not by the fact that you didn't ever have any kind of a political activity before. Now, in closing, let me just respond to Joel's comment. Joel, you know very well that that land swap deal was a thing that was approved without any dissent, without any uh, objection, long before this whole uh, matter of, of the uh, shady dealings of Occidental Oil Company and some of the activities in City Hall. When those matters came to our attention, I was along with you. I wasn't there. I was along with you. No, I wasn't First among, yes, you were there. No, I wasn't. First among those who were willing to. <laughs> October 10, 1969. First among those willing to speak out on this question of that conditional use permit. First to speak out in connection with that. Uh, that whole issue of the influence of the mayor's office in trying to get them to reconsider their prior decision that they had to have, uh, an, envi had to have an environmental impact report. First, to present that matter to the grand jury and ask them to look at the whole range of issues, including that land swap, including the removal of files uh, from uh, 
the city by the Occidental lobbyists. All of these things, when they came to our attention, were matters in which I got involved. And I was among, among those, along with you, who voted against that uh, approval of that, uh, that conditional use uh, issue. So I think that uh, you've got to be honest and fair with the people when you talk about those and to indicate what are the present facts and what were the facts um, what four years ago when that matter first came before the City Council. They're quite different and you know it very well. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. Thank you Mr. Bradley. Next speaking will be Mr. Watson. Five minutes is a very short time. Let's get on with it. I'm Dr. Mal Watson. I'm the first black doctor lawyer in this country, and I'm very proud of that. But more than that, I'm proud of the fact that I've trained myself to come to this point. I've spent all those years in medical school. I've spent all those years in law school. I've worked with people as a doctor. I've worked with them as a lawyer. I'm now ready to take over the reins for the changes that have to come in this government. Now, if you want to know who I am, let me tell you. This morning in the L.A. Times, there was an, an article about the Women Four meeting approximately two weeks ago, where the women voted among the four candidates that they had appear before them, these four gentlemen over here minus Jesse Unruh. Now, in that vote, four of those gentlemen got some votes, but there was an 18% undecided Translated, that's me. I'm undecided. I represent that 18% that's now undecided. When this campaign started, they took a poll and there was approximately 3 to 4 to 5%, depending on which poll you read. That's come up to 18%, I believe, and I'm the cause for it. Let me tell you why. You're going to have a chance to ask questions when this program is over. I want you to ask any candidate on the stage who was the first candidate who talked about the mass transportation problem as being a dichotomous situation, a now problem and a future problem. Who was the first candidate that talked about putting policemen onto the streets in those poverty pockets in the South Central Los Angeles area, in the Barrio in East Los Angeles, in the poor white neighborhoods, put them on the street and let them develop that human-to-human -human communication, absolutely necessary to provide protection rather than putting foreign occupation troops out there. You ask any candidate on this stage, who was the first candidate that talked about the city government having to change to meet the responsiveness that it has to have to the people and to meet the needs for efficiency in city government? Who first talked about the city manager concept? Who first talked about, quotation marks, the managerial system of government? Ask any of these candidates on the stage, who was the first person to talk in terms of what are you doing spending all of this money on political campaigns? Now I ask you very simply, it has been in the paper very recently that one of the major candidates for this office is spending $2,500 per 30-second ad on television. How many thousands of families in Los Angeles don't even get $2,500 a year to live on? And yet we allow the system to force us into spending over half a million dollars, as Sam Yorty did in 69, just to get elected to an office that pays $35,000. You ask any of these candidates who was the first to bring that issue up. If you get a truthful answer to any or all of those questions, it has to be Mal Watson, because I was the first one to bring them to the fore. Now let me tell you something else I believe about this expenditure of campaign funds. 
Frank Holloman is the assemblyman from the 65th district. I feel a great deal of regard and respect for that man because he did something two weeks ago that's never been done in this state before. After he got elected, he had an awards testimonial dinner, but it wasn't for him, it was for the people who worked in the campaign, the people who walked the streets, precinct workers, polling place workers. He gave them an awards dinner. And if tomorrow morning somebody gave me $5,000 for my campaign, I tell you, I'd take that $5,000 and I'd have a Mal Watson for mayor breakfast in South Los Angeles and feed people, not bleed them. That's what I believe in. Those are my pledges. I pledge to you that I have trained myself to face change, and change must come. Change must come in our city government. We have to get rid of the mayor's office because he does nothing more than act as a functionary and ambassador at large. If we want a king, let's name him that. Let's elect him every 10 years and give him a bunch of keys. Let him meet planes coming in instead of going out on all of them. One <laughs> final thing I'd like to say to you. One thing I'd like to say. I'm sure all of you noticed in the press and over television in the last couple of days Sam Yorty's attack on Tom Bradley for using city funds to fly to Washington to a meeting where Councilwoman Pat Russell and Councilman Bernardi went to. I think that is an absolutely horrendous thing for the mayor of this city to do. Tom Bradley went there to represent us, and the city should have paid $365 for his airplane ticket. I don't want anybody else to lure themselves to that sort of ta tactic. Sam, you already better come out of the woodwork and stop playing ants, and flies, and other insects with people. Let's talk. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Next speaking will be, will be Ms. Olga Rodriguez of the Socialist Workers' Party. I'd first like to say in deference to the gentlemen on the panel that uh, I am not among them. I am a woman candidate and not a gentleman. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming here, but I especially want to bring solidarity and greetings to the sisters in the audience today because tomorrow is International Women's Day, and we have something to celebrate, sisters. We have just won a major victory through our struggles in the streets for the right of us ourselves to control our own bodies and our uteruses in face of the law. And I'd like to say that tomorrow, International Women's Day, marks the first time in a long time in America when women have something to be proud of for the fight we have just won. And hopefully it marks a new dawning for the women's liberation struggle in this country where we will take our struggle further. Now it's all true what Mr. Bradley and Mr. Redden say that on these candidates days it's been very difficult because they all begin sounding alike. It's true. All of the other candidates who get up here begin to sound alike. Now we have to ask ourselves why they begin to sound alike. Mostly it's because not a single one of them and none of them have any significant different fundamental positions on any major issue facing this city. Mr. Wax says we don't need a revolution in this country. What we need simply are people in power. What we need are more people like Mr. Wax in power to be our mayor. What we need to, rely, to do is to rely on people like Mr. Wax, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Redden, and let us not forget Mr. Sam Yorty, to solve all our problems. Now what is the choice Los Angeles voters have in this race? We have to look at that. Who do we have to choose from if you discount myself as a candidate? We have to choose from an ex-police chief who is proud of the fact that he introduced the idea of police on the campuses. We have an ex-police lieutenant who is now a councilman 
and has been a councilman in a period when the situation in Los Angeles has degenerated, we have a councilman who speaks as the anti-establishment candidate while he was in office with another councilman running for mayor. Not a single thing was done by the city council of the city of Los Angeles to end the war in Vietnam. And in fact, and in fact, this city council was the same city council under the directorship of Mr. Sam Yorty that led and okayed the idea of sending police on the campus to smash demonstrations during May of 1970. Now we have an opportunity before us in Los Angeles. The New York Times reports that President Nixon is proud to announce that the meeting between himself and another arch war criminal will take place April 2nd and 3rd in San Clemente, and that there they will discuss further what shall be done to the Vietnamese people. Now students on this campus have been in the forefront in the struggle of the anti-war movement in Los Angeles, and I hope all of us will be out demonstrating against this meeting and calling for an end to the two dictatorship. Now specifically on the problems that the grassroots, I think, which is sponsoring this forum has called for, speaking to, are the questions of mass transit, smog, the question of revenue sharing, and the Nixon cutbacks, and one of my favorite subjects, police, what they put as misconduct, and I call brutality, in the city of Los Angeles under Chief Davis. I want to speak very briefly to the question of mass transit in Los Angeles and the question of smog. It's true, every candidate is speaking for mass transit. It's one of those things that you really can't be against these days, especially when people have to drive 30 or more miles a day to get to and from work and school <laughs> and so forth on smog-infested freeways that are overcrowded, unsafe, and obsolete. Now, the proposals that have been put forward by all of the other mayoral candidates require that you and I pay out of our pockets for a situation that has been produced in this city of smog and pollution, not by us and not by our own will, but by a handful of, full of people who benefit from the smog and pollution in the city and make billions off of it. As a socialist, I stand for free mass rapid transit, and I think that the problem is so at this point, it's such a crisis that we cannot wait until Jess Unruh digs his first hole in 1974, that what we have to do is to begin immediately and call a public mass meeting of everyone in the city of Los Angeles concerned with the problem, to discuss the problem and come up with solutions, and further that the city at this time should purchase all of the non-polluting buses it can get its hands on and establish convenient routes to and from workplaces and homes. And I think that the way that the mass transit system in Los Angeles has to be financed is not to make the criminal the victim in this situation, those people who make billions off pollution and have our gas rationed, but to make those people who've been making billions pay for the mass transit in this city. And what I call for is a 100% city tax on the mass polluters in this city, the oil industry and the auto industry. Finally, I'd like to say on the question of police misconduct, because this is an important question. The way we're going to solve the problems of violence in the city is to hit the source of violence. The violence that is done to us every day when there's unemployment. The violence of having young Chicano and black people have 50% unemployment in their communities in this city. The violence that is done to poor people every day when we have absolutely no control over our lives. The violence that is done when 200 out of 1,000 black and Chicano young people have their tuberculosis tests show up positive when only one out of 1,000 Anglos do and having clinics shut down instead of opened up in those communities. The way we're going to end that violence and end the violence of alienating schools in this city is not by putting more men in blue as they would have it on those campuses but letting students on those campuses and faculty on those campuses control those campuses and decide how to best deal with that problem. 
The way we're going to end the violence in the black and Chicano community is to take the occupation forces out of our communities and get their foot off our necks. And the way we're going to do that is to give the black and Chicano communities our right to control every single institution in our communities, especially the police department. There's one final thing here. Now we know that the other candidates sound all the same. And I think it's important that we look into why they do. It's not because we've all been talking together and we've gotten to know each other very well. I'm I am insulted to think that I would sound like these other candidates. I don't ask you to come and vote for me as the better individual. Individuals are not going to solve the problems in this city. In fact, the individuals who have been in office have, have caused the problems to get worse. What we need is to organize ourselves in independent movements to fight those individuals now in office who represent people like the Committee of 25 to fight for our rights as women did and won our struggle for the repeal of abortion laws. And I, of course, encourage all of you to vote for me because my campaign is the only campaign that addresses itself to the way we're going to fight and win and solve the problems in Los Angeles and in the United States. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Um, while we're waiting for the mics to be set up, there'll be two standing mics in the aisles. I'd like to ask all the candidates to keep their responses brief because our program is limited till 1 o'clock. Also, I'd like to correct the forum is being sponsored by the speakers program and not by Grassroots Forum. Would the sound technician turn on the mics, please, wherever you are? In a lighter vein, I'd like to announce that Cal Worthington and his pet dog, or rather, his, his dog Spot, will be appearing at Meyerhoff Park this Friday at 12 noon. Is the sound working? Okay. Uh, Mr. Wax, you constantly mention the idea that you're opposed to corruption. You think we should have a bold, outspoken mayor. And I'd like to know not who you voted for in the past presidential election, but did you vote for Richard Nixon? And I ask you this because I think the people of this country have an opinion, even those who voted for him, that he is the most corrupt president that we have had in my lifetime. I'm not going to answer that, and I'll tell you why, but I'll tell you what I did do. I personally, you know, we can get down to nine million elections and you're going to divide everyone until finally there's no one you could vote for. I stand accountable for the people I openly spoke for. Uh, the only persons that I openly spoke for in the last election were Shirley Chisholm and Marvin Browdy. I'd like to ask Mr. Bradley this question. I'd like to know your position on the contracts Los Angeles now has and those proposed in the future with the Four Corners power plant in Black Mesa, Arizona, which is strip mining the Navajo and Hopi reservation. I introduced a motion in the city council that would deny the Department of Water and Power the right to engage in or to uh, participate in the supplemental agreements with some 20 other power companies uh, who are taking power out of the Four Corners area. I further ask that they produce for us a plan that would minimize the pollution there, control it just as we would if we were developing that power right here in our own community. I don't think we ought to pollute there if we are not going to pollute in our backyards. I don't think we ought to devastate the Indian lands there if we would not devastate our lands here. I further ask that they provide for us a long-range program on the energy crisis 
They've not done that yet. But the council, by an 87 vote, did in fact approve the motion which I introduced and did in fact refuse to approve the agreement between Water and Power and the other uh, 20 power companies involved in that consortium. Council. Hello. No. Councilman Wax, it's, it has been rumored that you are in the running for mayor this year simply to get name recognition for the 1974 congressional elections. Do you plan to challenge either Barry Goldwater, Tom Reese, or Al Bell? Yeah, what a choice. <laughs> <laughs> No, the, those rumors are, 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 have crept up from the beginning by uh, people who wanted to make the rumors. I entered the race because I believe I could win. I entered the race because I believed that I was distinguished from the other four, quote, major, unquote, candidates, and that if I could simply get my person and my message to enough people, we could get the approximately 20% of the vote that would be needed to get in the runoff, and then in the runoff, unlike some of the other candidates who were leading in the beginning, I could win. And that is the basic reason why I'm running, and it is still the reason, and I think we're approaching that day. Then there's absolutely no way you will be a candidate in 1974 for Congress. Oh, no plans, right? whatever. Okay. I'm telling you, I'm sick and tired of asking people for money to run for office. <laughs> My folks only have so much. <laughs> Mr. Bradley, I was wondering if you could tell me why you were absent from city council when the crucial issue and vote on no oil and the Palisades, Palisades oil drilling came up. I don't know where you got that information. It's wrong. He was there. Mr. Waxel. Mr. Wax will tell you how it was there. <laughs> okay, then I got another one for you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your facts are better this time. Yeah. Well, this one I got from the L.A. Times. And according to that, it said... <laughs> it said that your... My admonition stands. <laughs> that your absentee record was comparable to Sam Yorty's. No, it didn't say that. What did it say? The LA Times simply reported the absences of members of the city council and the mayor, and they didn't try to make any comparison between them. And uh, I was second in terms of the number of times absent from the city council, but I think that it, it is also fair to say to you that there is no member of the city council who, in my judgment, abuses what we call the right to personal privilege, personal business. Those absences that uh, were uh, attributed to me were for five days of vacation during that period and for representation of this city in various places, various meetings, and various associations throughout the country. Those were the reasons why I was absent. And, uh, uh, but I think that, that uh, you really ought to take a look at not how many times you're out of the city. But what do you do when you're here? Because I think that's the <laughs> crucial issue in this campaign. You know, if, if Sam Yorty performed while he was in this city, I'd be quite happy about it. I wouldn't care how many times he took a trip. I have three questions that I would like to ask to all of, that I would like responses from all of the candidates for that relate to, that relate to the police, uh, some if candidates don't wish to answer it, they, they don't have to. They relate to the police department and the system of justice in the city of Los Angeles. The first one is on the case of Los Tres del Barrio, who are three Chicano activists who have been um, imprisoned and charged um, with, uh, with murder by the uh, by the by federal officers. These three Chicanos were involved in a campaign to rid the Chicano community of drugs. Um, and they were entrapped and, um, and arrested with the cooperation of the Los Angeles Police Department. Another question that I have is on the, um, the is, is, on, is on, an ant, uh, on a case involving anti-war activists. Russo and Ellsberg, who were being tried by the f by federal authorities 
in the city of Los Angeles. It seems to me that this case is blatantly uh, a frame up and it should not be going on in the city of Los Angeles that candidates for mayor should speak out against this injustice. The final question, and um, I'd like to know yes Wait, or no, do you think that the time that is limited, so would, would you give them a chance the just to answer those two okay, questions? The, the, final, the final question <laughs> is on the wrong is on the role of police in the schools because I think that the police department are responsible for entrapping um, people who are involved in the movements for social change like these Chicano activists. I don't think that they're the ones who can solve the, uh, who can solve the problem of violence in the schools. I think that they help to create that. Do the candidates for mayor think that putting police in the schools is a good way to end violence in the schools. Are you running for office? I, I, I support the socialist candidate for mayor, Olga Rodriguez. Kenneth? I will be brief. I, I just would say, A, with respect to entrapment, I oppose entrapment in any form. No matter what it's used for, I don't think it's proper. Uh, as far as particular cases, I, I really believe that there has to be one basic authority in our system that determines innocence or guilt, and that is the judiciary. That's what held true with Angela Davis on one side. It's what holds true with others on the other. And I accept those decisions because I know of no other person or institution that can step in and play that role. And uh, I basically <laughs> adhere to that system that when the judiciary makes a determination, I accept it. If I might speak for the other candidates, I. Unfortunately, we only have approximately six minutes left. All of your questions are questions laden with many emotional, emotionally charged issues. These are not issues that five people can discuss intelligently with you in five or six minutes. I'm speaking tomorrow at 12 o'clock at Meyerhoff. I'd be glad to discuss it with you then because we'll have more time. But I think the other candidates should be given an opportunity to speak to questions that they can answer in a short period of time. Yeah, I'd like to speak. <laughs> I'd like to speak to the case of uh, Los Tres del Barrio, about three young Chicano activists who were entrapped by federal agents uh, and are now serving prison terms in different federal penitentiaries. This case is being, uh, there's been a defense committee formed and this committee is, is moving and, and uh, calling for a new trial and for the freedom of Los Tres. I think that the question here that's involved is much deeper than simply the case of Los Tres. It's the question of drugs in the black and Chicano community and the role of those drugs and the role of police in maintaining a situation where drug pushers and dealers are set free and activists like Los Tres who try to get them out of the communities are put in jail. Uh, I completely solidarize myself with the sentiments of the black and Chicano community that these drugs are there for a purpose of control in the community and, co and completely sympathize with Carnalismo, the group which is organizing the defense of Los Tres del Barrio uh, in their attempts to educate the Chicano youth about the dangers of hard drugs. I think that the question of complicity with the police as far as the drug traffic is concerned in this country is very clear, especially if people have read recently the case of the uh, French Connection drugs in New York City, which have been ripped off right from underneath the police uh, commissioner's nose by policemen. And uh, in my opinion, drugs could not exist to the extent they do in those communities if it were not for the direct complicity of the police. On the case of Ellsberg and Rousseau, uh, I completely support their freedom and think that what Ellsberg and Rousseau did was simply to release to the American public what the American public should have known a long time ago and that uh, this is obviously a frame-up, and people of Los Angeles should certainly protest the actions going on in the federal court here. On the role of police in the schools, I am opposed to police on the campuses and for the complete right of students and faculty and organizations of the campus itself to decide everything that goes on in the school, including curricula, including how to patrol the campuses, and uh, whatever is necessary to make schools institutions of learning rather than prisons. I, th I think we ought to give Ms. Rodriguez a big hand because she's obviously given a lot of thought to the answers to those questions.
She deserves the applause, please. Mr. Bradley or Mr. Redden, do you want to respond? Uh, you next respond? question. Next question from there, please. Okay. Suppose each of you are elected, or you are elected mayor, and I'd like to. This, go, uh, this uh, is going uh, to uh, rap, rapid transit. And uh, let's say you're elected mayor. What are the basic steps to introduce the program, and how s realistically, how soon do you think we can get a rapid transit system set up? I mean, actually. Is that a question working? to me. All right, Mr. Bradley. Yeah, I'd like everyone to. I'd like your all each opinion. Well, first of all, let me say very rapidly <laughs> that I feel that I believe in the private enterprise system. And if we had private companies who went into the rapid transit business who could be allowed to run buses according to the need, that is, in the morning and the afternoon when they are most needed, without governmental in interference forcing them to run buses, whether they're people to ride them or not, that they could do it at a profit and we could take government out of the private business sector so that we would not have to subsidize the bus system like we do airline systems. Those airlines have to fly planes whether you're on them or not. That's the result of governmental interference. Let's take government out of all of these private business sectors. How, how soon the, would this... These steps you, are... But how soon would... Could you each add how soon this would actually happen after you've become mayor? Would this be a year? Would this be That would be the what? second thing that I would start to do if I were elected mayor. The first thing I would try to do is to introduce the initiative for the people to get rid of me. I think the mayor's <laughs> office has to be done away with. That's the first priority. The second is to do something about moving people around rapidly and in large masses because we need to get people out of this congested city into areas where they can breathe. And you can't do that if it takes you two hours travel time in the morning and the afternoon. You can start immediately on the development. The first step is to convince the people of the need and what the program is going to be. You have to get the financing. You've got to turn the highway fund lobby in Sacramento around and get some of those highway funds for traffic. You have to get funds from Washington. You have to prepare a bond issue that the people will ac accept that closely ties rapid transit uh, to the problem of pollution. And in the meantime, you have to be working on systems that will take care of the now problem while you wait for the long range program. You can start right now on doing something about rapid transit. The earliest completion date depends upon whom you're looking to, the total system probably in the middle 1980s. Let me tell you what I've done, not what I promise. As far as rapid transit is concerned, I introduced a motion in 1971 calling on Rapid Transit District to report what they had done to develop their plans for rapid transit since their bond issue failed in 1968. We now have money available through the sales tax on gasoline. Our city gets four and a half million a year, the county a million and a half, and RTD gets 42 million a year. If they just commit 10 million as they promised to do so, we then will have the money when matched with the federal dollars two to one, can actually begin the construction of that system in 1974. That uh, study, which is going to make it possible for us to apply for the money, is now underway and should be completed in five months. When that's done, I think we can actually start on the first leg of the system. Now, that's not a total system, but it is a beginning, and I think that's where we have to start. I do support the idea of breaking the highway trust fund, both in Washington and in Sacramento, and I've been for that for a long time. But we need not wait for that to start the system. I believe also that we need to use the buses on the freeways, our existing freeways. Use those freeway flyers in the peak hours to move people in and out of town. Require them uh, to use only that uh, single lane on the freeway and nobody else can use it during those hours. And I think you pretty soon get people out of their automobiles when they see those buses whizzing by at 60 miles an hour while they're parked. The <laughs> These are just some of the steps, both in immediate and long term, that I think ought to be taken, can be taken, and I see the start. I don't want to predict for you a completion date, but I see a start in 1974. I think that the first thing that has to be done is to begin solving the problem now. It's going to take time to what we've been having is a lot of experts thinking about mass transit, nothing being done. In the early part of the campaign, uh, 
Mr. Jesse Unruh proposed, uh, I believe, to all the mayoral candidates, at least I received a letter, that all the candidates join in a united front on his program for mass transit, <laughs> uh, which basically would make those of us who've been paying for the problem in the first place continue to pay, but in, in greater amounts. I'm opposed to a bond issue paying for the rapid transit system in this city. Uh, I think that the way the rapid transit has to be paid is to make those people who've been profiting from pollution in the city pay for the rapid transit system. And uh, people understand the kinds of profits that oil companies and, and auto industry makes in the city. That's not a hard thing to do for them. On the question, I believe an immediate thing has to be done, as I said before, placing non-polluting buses on the freeways uh, which in established convenient routes as it is now, people are wary of taking buses and there's no, uh, in my opinion, having had to take a bus several times, there's good reason for it. You have to take four or five buses to get where you really want to go. And I, what I think needs to do be done is have more buses, which are non-polluting, establish convenient routes to and from all work areas and, and home and residence and schools, and then have shuttle buses from the freeway into the downtown area. Uh, secondly, I think that what needs to be done, and I think it's important that the people in the city who've had to suffer from the pollution and the transportation crisis have an opportunity to get together with, with the experts, as they say, and to discuss the problem and come up with a solution and then to begin immediately implementation of this problem, of the solution. Your question is rapid transit, <coughs> and, you know, it's a perfect issue. You know, if words were rides, our transportation problem been solved through the year 2000. We're farther behind than we were a decade ago. We have the expertise. We have the technology. The argument isn't over which route or which mode or modes. The key is financing. No matter which route you pick or which routes for a comprehensive system or which mode or which modes in total package, it's going to have to be paid for. It's not going to fall out of the sky and be here. The logical source of funds exists right now. There is more than a billion dollars in state highway taxes right now in Sacramento, a greater amount in federal funds in Washington, in the highway lobby, i.e. the oil companies, the auto club, and the auto manufacturers have a have and have had a hammerlock on those funds and refuse to be allow, allow them to be used for anything other than ribbons and ribbons of concrete freeways which are destroying our city and they have got to be diverted for its legitimate use rapid transit and as mayor of the city of Los Angeles as the most powerful po potentially powerful political person in this state just as I engaged as a councilman with Proposition 20, the Coastline Initiative, I would, on the 1974 ballot, lead an initiative measure which would get passed to break those funds loose. And until we get those funds, all the rest is pie in the sky. I would like to thank all the candidates for appearing. I understand that many of them have other appointments and they won't be able to take any more questions. However, I suggest that those who do have some free time of, of the candidates, if they could, perhaps just to stay around and talk with some of the students. Thank you for coming.